welcome to The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. It is Tuesday, May the 4th, 2021. On this episode of The Politocrat, headlines and deadlines. That, coming up next. We are the New York Knicks! We are the New York Knicks! The New York Knicks. I play that theme. The Go New York Go song from 1994. That's right. It's been it's been a while since the Knicks were of any real relevance in the NBA. I had season tickets during that year. I had season tickets for 10 years for the New York Knicks. And that was one of the great years. Even though the Knicks did not end up winning the NBA Finals, they lost in seven games that year in the NBA Finals to the Houston Rockets, who this year, by the way, are the worst team in the NBA, one of the two worst teams in the NBA. But even though 1994 was not uh, eventually uh, the year that the Knicks ended up winning it all. The last time they had won everything in the NBA was 1973. 1994 was an exciting year to be a New York Knicks fan. It really was. So, you know, I remember that year really well. And the reason I do play that tune um, on this day, on this Tuesday, is because the New York Knicks are actually relevant again. (laughs) And they have a genuine chance to do well in the playoffs. And yes, I said the word playoffs. The Knicks will make the playoffs, barring some real calamity, which it ain't happening. They are firmly entrenched in the playoff scene in the National Basketball Association. And, dear listener, your New York Knicks are in a position now where they can finish the number four seed. Johnny Nash with I Can See Clearly Now. And welcome to this edition of the Politocrat Daily Podcast. I am Omar Moore, and thank you for your time, for your precious time and your ear, you know. Um, Again, I I never, ever hesitate to to tell you how much I appreciate you and how much I respect you um, for listening, for taking the time to listen, and for also spreading the word about this podcast. It, It really is very much appreciated. And I hope your day is going well. I really do. I hope that it is a sunny day in your heart, most importantly, um, as well as all around you. You know, the sky hopefully is blue and, you know, uh, know, the sun is shining. Maybe some people don't like the sun to be shining. I don't know. Some people like it to be foggy and cloudy and there's a romantic aspect to that. And there is. But it's great to see the sun out, isn't it? I mean, here in San Francisco, that's what has been happening during the course of this day. And I hope it is where you are. But if it's not, I hope that you are um, still managing to get out and about if you can. And I want to just also say that exercise is really important. It's very important for your physical uh, well-being and health, but it's also important for your mental health. And if you are able to, and I say again, if you are able to, please, please spend at least half an hour every day doing some form of exercise. I really do think it's good and preferably in the morning, first thing in the morning, make exercise the first thing you do. Whether that's taking a walk, if you can walk, whether it's running, if you can run. Whether it's power walking, whether it is whatever it is, if you can get outside 
and walk or run, please do so. If you can't get outside and you're not able to walk or run, then try yoga if you can, indoors, yoga, breathing exercises. If you can't do yoga, breathing exercises are really important. Take deep breaths. Take deep breaths. Take a a one minute session every two minutes and take in deep breaths in and out. Take in the deep breath, exhale the deep breath and do that for a minute at a time every two minutes or every other minute. Just do that for a five minute stretch, a 10 minute stretch. Let's say five minutes, five minutes of deep breaths and exhales. Do that for one minute, then take a half minute to a minute off, then do it again for another minute and do five one minute sessions of inhale, exhale. I'm telling you that will set your mind right in terms of the way you begin a day. So please, please. A breathing exercise is really good for you mentally. Now, I'm not a doctor. I don't play one on television. I don't play one on a podcast. I don't play a doctor at all. I'm not a doctor. But I do know that breathing exercises do help you. They really do. They help you to think more clearly. They help you to focus more clearly. And if you are someone who is unable to physically move around, breathing exercises are an absolute godsend. If you have the discipline to do them one minute for five one minute sections, if you can do that, that would be really great. Now, I recognize there are people who have issues of COPD, COPD, which is really serious. And so breathing exercises are not practical for people who have COPD or if there are other ailments or issues, asthma, breathing exercises such as the ones I'm speaking of may be problematic for someone who's asthmatic. Unless you're doing this with an inhaler and and even then, I don't know if that's going to be efficacious for people in that position. So look, I am mindful of the fact that not everyone would be, will be able to do these things. I do think that if you are unable to do any of the things I've just pointed to, I do think that if someone is able to bring you out to your balcony, bring you out to a window, if you are someone who utilizes a wheelchair, and you are able to wheel yourself to a window in the domicile that you are in, whether it's your home, whether it's in uh, another structure inside somewhere, and you're able to get to a window and someone can wheel you over to a window and you can just sit by that window or have the window cracked open or be by that window and just take in what you're seeing outside. Hopefully what you're seeing um, is beautiful scenery. Because I can tell you, if you just look out a window at scenery, and preferably that scenery being trees, grass, water, if you're so lucky. Um, And I am very fortunate. I've got those things I've just described are are things that are all uh, close by. But the vast majority of people do not have that. Some people get to, you know, are living on farms, living on ranches. They have the ability to, and the fortune to have all of that. Because it is very therapeutic to have nature around you, to have a lot of it around you, to take that in, to be in and amongst it. So if you are someone who utilizes a wheelchair, if you can wheel yourself over to a window or if you can have someone do that for you or you can have someone wheel you out to a balcony or you can do that for yourself or if you can have someone wheel you outside and take you outside or if you do that yourself and explore outside I'm telling you even for 10 or 15 minutes that would be really great but all I I say all of this because it's just important to to try to stay healthy to try to uh, in this pandemic era that we are all living through try to keep 
and maintain some kind of connection with the outside. And I don't know what you were doing, dear listener, before this pandemic hit. I don't know what your um, profession was. I don't know whether you were working, whether you weren't. I don't know what you do to occupy your day with. But I guarantee you, if you integrate a half hour, at least between a half hour and an hour of exercise daily, or even three times a week, as I've said in the past, but daily, um, as the weather gets a bit warmer, as people have begin to get vaccinated, it will really start to make a difference to you. And please, when you're outside, wear a mask. Whether you're exercising or not, wear a mask, please. You know, please do that. It's so important. Wear a mask. When you're running, wear a mask. I know it's difficult. You know, you have to get used to running with a mask on for those of you who are runners. And I used to run very early, and I still do, but I used to run without a mask on during this pandemic. I stopped doing that. And very soon after, I started to run with a mask on, even though there was literally no one else around. I mean, literally, the times that I would run in the mornings and still do, there's no one around. You'll you'll see maybe one or two people, but no one around. But I wear the mask when I run because that's still important. You, You shouldn't not do that. I see so many people not running with a mask on. They're just running and they don't make any attempt, many of them, to move away from you. And let me tell you something. When I run with a mask on, I always, always, if I see people, I make it a point to run as far away from them as possible. Seriously. And they may have masks on, and I still do that. No, I don't want a cookie. I'm simply saying that it's important to be considerate of others. Whether they're running or not, whether they have a mask on or not, I run away from people who have masks on. I run away from people who don't. But the people who run without a mask don't make any effort to run away from me. (laughs) Or from perhaps many other people, not just myself. And, you know, you're dealing with selfish people. There's selfish people in this world, of course. There are good people in this world and there are selfish people in this world. There are people who can drive in this world and then there are dicks behind the wheel. Like this particular woman I saw as I was running this morning. You know, I just don't understand people. I really don't. Some people, at least. White woman behind the steering wheel. She somehow is able to see. And in the United States, we drive on the left-hand side of the road, right? Or what do you know? Rather, we, we are in the left. The driver's steering wheel is in the, on the left side. I'll, I'll put it like that. So... Somehow she could see the bicyclist who was on her right, who was trying to signal across her and go all the way across her and make a left turn. Somehow she could see her wearing a nearly all black bicyclist uniform, right? But she couldn't see me dressed all in white running across the crosswalk right in front of her. Blooming woman nearly, blooming fool nearly run me over. She nearly run me over, seriously. It's just, God, it's unbelievable. Uh, Honestly, honestly. It's just absolute, and and then she jammed on her brakes. I just looked at her. You know, I just ran, I just looked at her and just kept running. Because A, I'm running. B, I've got a mask on. C, right, when you're running, you've got to modulate your breathing and you're doing that in rhythm and If I now curse her ass out, that's now going to be me wasting oxygen on an idiot who doesn't know how to drive and nearly hits me. And then my whole energy and my focus and my approach to the run is now altered because I'm now going to throw energy, negative or otherwise, at this idiot, this dick who doesn't know how to freaking well drive or who wants to run a black person over or who's just a freaking idiot. How could you not see a person running right in front of you and you've made a very clear case to stop at the crosswalk for a woman who is cycling, who is wearing a nearly all black cycling outfit and she turns in front of you and I'm running across the crosswalk. I have the right of way And I'm wearing all white and you can't see me? 
Yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. Oh, you just took your eye off the off the street, did you? <laughs> oh, dearie me. What? What? I tell you. I tell you. I, and I deal with this a lot. Who These folks cannot drive, okay? You've got people who cannot drive. And I'm telling you, this week alone, there have been three incidents of this where I've nearly been hit. I guess that, I guess, I don't know if that's a message to me or if it's a message about the people who are doing this. I think it's kind of both, but it's really that you've got dicks behind the wheel. May the 4th be with you and welcome back. You know, I look, I went from in that last segment <laughs> from I can see clearly now to dicks behind the wheel. I mean, come on. Isn't that a typical transition from yours truly? <laughs> only, only, <laughs> only on the Politocrat Daily Podcast can you get such wild vacillations. <laughs> that was John Williams, by the way, with the main theme from Star Wars. And welcome back. And thank you very much for your uh, indulgence and your time. I really do value and respect and appreciate you listening. Um, this episode, because <laughs> it is May 4th and, you know, yeah, may, may the 4th be with you. Um, and uh, again, I do hope you're well. I just had to get that off my chest about these these drivers around here in this part of San Francisco, I have to tell you, oh God, these and they can barely see over the wheel anyway. <laughs> Look at these big ass SUVs, motherfuckers can't even see over the damn steering wheel. <laughs> what a pathetic lot, honestly, honestly. And these are the people who are running companies, and you know. Ooh, and I've got my boutique store. And speaking of stores, by the way, and another transition, please head now to the Politocrat Daily Podcast online store at the dash politocrat.myshopify.com. All kinds of great items await you. So please purchase now, now, now at the Politocrat Daily Podcast online store at the dash politocrat.myshopify.com new t-shirts including this legendary quote from Ella Wheeler Wilcox a great poet and author and James Baldwin t-shirts the fire this time you gotta take a look at those you really do and the vaccinated AF t-shirts and you know what AF stands for so those t-shirts and lots of other items new hoodies are in too the think, write, learn, live, love, vote. Six of the best. The hoodie collection, too, with that particular six words on it. And people are buying. And I want you to be one of those people buying. And for those of you who are awaiting your merchandise, please be patient. It's on its way to you. I really do appreciate that. And um, I wish that, you know, some people who are purchasing aren't leaving email addresses. And so I can't communicate to you, dear listener, and the team cannot do that if you don't leave an email address. That's not something that I can do if you don't leave an email address. But anyway. I do want to thank you for your purchase. More of you, please get on board. Purchase now at the Politocrat Daily Podcast online store. Spread the word, spread the word. The dash politocrat dot myshopify dot com. Thank you. Health is so very important. Look, you know, today I really want to talk headlines and deadlines and health is really important. So this is the deadline portion. You, if you are in the United States, and if you do not have any kind of health care at all, 
I would strongly advise you to go to healthcare.gov right now. Right now. Right now. Because you can sign up right now for lower priced health care. The Affordable Care Act was a very important thing in this country. And I know there are some people who don't like the act. It doesn't go far enough. And I totally agree it doesn't. But I can tell you, if you do not have health insurance, this is why you need to get on board healthcare.gov right now. Go sign up. You have until August the 15th. But don't wait until August to do this. Do it now. Do it now. So please sign up for affordable Healthcare. You get a chance to pick from exchanges and all this kind of thing. And hey, you know, in some states, you get to pay $1 a month for health care. Your health care premium. Fancy that. If you're in California, you can get to do that. Depending on what your plan is and, of course, your background in terms of your economics and all the other rest of it, all the rest of it. But my goodness me, I, I almost fell out of my chair. When I saw that ad, I talked about this the other day, that ad here in San Francisco that said covered California D pays only one dollar a month. I'm like, what the fuck? You know, (laughs) one dollar a month for a premium. Gee, man, I mean, you can't beat that with a stick. So please, please, if you are in the United States of America. Please sign up for healthcare.gov. I'm not saying that every state is going to offer $1 a month for premiums. I'm not saying that, but I know that based on this ad I saw, they do that here in California. $3 billion of aid was granted to the state of California to do this, which is why, and that's President Biden you have to thank for that, why you've seen this happen. It's just unreal. People are paying a dollar for a premium. Do you know how expensive premiums are. They go up every year. You know how expensive that is? But you know, if you're not in the United States, you have no idea how expensive it is because you don't pay really anything, do you now? Next to nothing. You don't pay next to anything for healthcare. It's pretty much free. Now, yes, there's some things you'd have to pay and whatever, but not like here in the United States. Not like here. In Canada, you just go north of the border And you are getting prescription drugs for next to nothing. Next to nothing. Here, thousands of dollars. Here, hundreds of dollars. It's 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 incredible. But anyway, please sign up for healthcare.gov. If you're listening to this and you're in the United States and you do not have any healthcare insurance at all, please sign up at healthcare.gov. Follow the information. And I think you'll be glad you did. Your health is very important. So I'm going to remind you again that you have to get checked. Please, a routine checkup. Even if you feel fine, just get a checkup. Do not wait until something happens to you. Ooh, I feel this lump here. Ooh, this doesn't feel right. Oh, I have this pain here. Please, make it your business to be proactive about your health. Please get a checkup. I know there are some people who do not like to go to the doctor because they are afraid of what they might find. Men in particular are particularly um, the ones that I am thinking of here because there are a cross-section of men who just don't want to go to the doctor. Oh, no, I can't go. Because they're afraid of what they may find. There are women the same way who may be afraid of what they may find, but... I would say that more women are generally more proactive about going to a doctor than men are. They are, I'd say, more likely to be going to a doctor. Anybody, I don't care who you are, please go and get checked. Go and get your physical. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. I know this pandemic obviously has set people back. But I think now, as long as you're wearing your mask, as long as you're wearing your gloves, as long as you um, are getting vaccinated, Please, please, please go to the doctor. Even if you haven't been vaccinated yet, please go and get checked. Wear your mask, go and get checked. I'm telling you, whether it's your heart health, heart health is so important. Heart disease is one of the top killers in this country, in the US, and I dare say in a number of other places too. So please get heart health, heart health, get your heart checked, 
Get everything checked. Please take an EKG. I'm telling you, electro, electrocardiogram. An EKG is very important. I mean, there's things called silent heart attacks. There's things called cardiac arrest, which of course people know of. And some people have experienced. And maybe you've had someone that you know or someone very close to you in your family who's experienced a heart attack. And look, these things are not pleasant, obviously. Please get checked so that you can ward off any kind of unpleasant surprise. Because we don't like surprises that are not pleasant. And it really would be a good thing for you to get checked now. Be proactive about your heart. Be proactive about everything health-wise. Your prostate, your breasts, you know, testicular, everything. You, you, p- please, I cannot stress this enough. And I'm going to continue to say this. Right? So this is not going to be the last time you hear me say this on this particular podcast. But I really do want you to, dear listener, be in touch with your health. Be proactive with your health. I know if you're not insured, you're worried because if you're not insured, you're going to be paying a boatload conceivably for an appointment. It depends. It depends. Right. Your copay at a routine checkup could be one hundred dollars if you're in the United States. Potentially, that's if you don't have insurance. Right. If you have insurance, it may be $10, it may be 15 it may be 20 right? Or it may be next to nothing, depending on what kind of health care plan you have in the United States. But if you don't have insurance in the United States, health-wise, you could be paying $100. I, I kid you not, between $75 and $100, you could, if not more than that. So I want you to sign up. If you've not signed up yet in the United States and you don't have health care insurance, Please, because in this country, we do this really great thing. Like we tie health care to our job. We do this freaking ingenious thing so that if you have a job, you get health care through that job. And when your ass is fired. There goes your health care. There goes your ass. And then you've got to go and find another job. And in a pandemic, good luck. Good luck. Because. You know there have been millions of jobs lost in the United States and in other countries due to this pandemic. Millions. Joe Biden, the president of this country, has restored 1.3 million jobs in his first 100 days. Faster than more jobs than any other president at that same time period in the history of the United States. But what I'm saying is, is that we have got to untangle and untether health care from your employment status. That's just absolutely asinine. We need to have a Medicare for all system. Bernie Sanders has written about this. And it appears in today's Guardian, by the way. And the topic, again, this episode is called Headlines and Deadlines. And so you're going to be hearing me talk about headlines and deadlines. I've talked about deadlines. And I'm going to be talking about them again in a few minutes. But Bernie Sanders has talked about this. Speaking of headlines now. Um, in The Guardian, that's where his, and it may have been syndicated there or it may have appeared there, um, there on its own course and its own accord. But Bernie Sanders has talked about this, about health care. And he's long been a proponent of Medicare for all. And there are other Democrats who have, although Bernie is an independent, but he caucuses with the Democrats. And again, we need Medicare for all in the United States. And Big Pharma, as Bernie Sanders writes, doesn't want us to expand Medicare. We have to fight them, says Bernie. This was from yesterday, May the 3rd, 2021. By lifting the ban on Medicare negotiation, uh, uh, let me say that again. By lifting the ban on Medicare negotiating prescription drug prices, we can expand benefits and lower the age of eligibility. Now, this is a really big thing. And this is a really good editorial from Bernie, this op-ed here that he writes. It appears in The Guardian. Uh, and um, yeah, this is really good. He he is talking about um, these prices and it's really a goldmine for Big Pharma. It's a goldmine for these companies. 
he praised in this editorial, Does Bernie Yesterday, yesterday he praised in the editorial op-ed that in The Guardian that President Biden's done a good job so far. It's a good start, but we need to go further. And this is Bernie. Bernie now is the chairman of the Senate Budget Committee. So he's a key person now, a key, key individual here. He's the chair of the Budget Committee in the Senate. So it's about money, folks. Money, honey. And he praises the American Rescue Plan. But it's not enough. And I agree. It doesn't go far enough. It's good. It's a really good start. And again, I keep saying this. Denmark's the country I love to quote here. Or I love to talk about. Because I know everything ain't perfect in Denmark. For sure. By a long shot. But I'm telling you, they take care of their citizenry a whole lot better than we do. A whole lot better. They actually care about them. And they're not nickel and diming them. So their health comes first. And the general welfare of the society comes first. Not the general welfare of the corporates and the billionaires. So what we have here in the United States is a welfare system for billionaires. And Bernie is talking about that. He has been talking about that forever. But that's what we have. I'm saying that independent of anything Bernie says, because I've known this forever, as have you, dear listener, that we have that, right? It's the oligarchs and all the other, you know, the billionaire class who are absolutely being taken care of. You want to talk about a nanny state? That's the thing that we say in the UK. Oh, the nanny state. That's what that's what our word is for welfare in the UK is nanny state. The nanny state is going to take care. Well, I'll tell you what, the nanny state has been taking care of billionaires since year dot and the nanny state has swaddled them in clothes and nappies and absolutely diapers same thing nappies and you know swaddled them in clothing away in a manger no crib for a bed the little lord billionaire lay down his sweet head I mean, really, that's what the nanny state is, right? No crib for a bed. Oh, my goodness me. They've got golden chariots they're sleeping on. While we've got people here in San Francisco, and you have where you are in your beloved city, sleeping on the paving stones for their beds, right? That's their bed in a country that's the richest on earth. And you've got the biggest wealth disparity in the country right here in San Francisco, California. Biggest wealth disparity in the country. The haves and the have-nots coexisting right next to each other. So in a really nice neighborhood, you've got lots of people without homes. And that's criminal to me. That is an indictment again of the system and how criminal it is. It's working just fine. For the folks who are being swaddled in golden chariots. But it's not working for the rest of us. And that's not something that you've not heard before here. Surely you've never heard me say that before. But that's what's happened. And then there's a rising amount of crime in San Francisco. As I kind of segue a bit here. But you've got to read this editorial from Bernie. But there's a rising tide of crime here in San Francisco. And again, this applies to all neighborhoods, but particularly these really decent, really good neighborhoods. I mean, take, for example, I walked into a grocery store just yesterday. And I literally saw somebody right in front of me as I'm walking past them, carrying out of this grocery store six, seven, eight items. Completely just walking out of the store with them and the two employees of the grocery store right behind him going, I know you're not going to pay for those, are you? You're not going to pay for those, are you? What do you think this is? Do you think this is your home? Do you think this is your playpen? I mean, what are they going to do to stop him? He just walks out with these items. He's He's struggling to hold them all. Seriously. It's cash and carry. Now, I want to just ask you something for a moment. I'm not condoning this person committing a crime. You won't get that from me here. 
I'm only asking you one question, one question that I want you to think about. Is there a matter of degree here? Is there a matter of, and I've frequently criticized others for saying this, so maybe I should criticize myself about this too. Is there a matter of degrees of worse here? And I'm going to do the thing that a lot of people do, and I really don't like to do this, but I'm going to do it. So shame on me. What's worse? That guy stealing five or six items out of a grocery store or billionaires not paying taxes at all. I welcome the unequivocal stance of the United States and the whole G7 on safeguarding uh, those vital democratic bulwarks in our media freedoms. As co-chair of the Global Media Freedom Coalition, uh, the UK is working with our partners so that we shine a light on the violations. Uh, we hold those to account. We support journal- journalists who are trying to shine a light on those abuses around the world. Uh, and uh, we try and reverse what is otherwise a dangerous trend. This cuts, I think, to the core of the values and the interests that the G rep- G7 represents right around the world. And it shows, uh, again, I think why it's so important for us to meet together uh, this week. Now, let me hand over to Tony. Tony, again, thanks for being here. Thanks for our valuable discussions uh, today. And I look forward, uh, and we look forward to welcoming President Biden to the UK in June. Uh, And I'm looking forward to uh, a productive G7 meeting this week. Thank you very much, Dominic. Uh, Let me, let me actually just start where where, where Dominic left off, which is uh, World Press Freedom Day, um, which uh, I have to tell you, I I take very much to heart uh, personally, as well as professionally. I, I actually started my career. Uh, as a journalist from the the relatively safe confines of of Washington, D.C. But uh, as Dominic said, I think uh, we're seeing every day uh, the work that uh, journalists are doing around the world in increasingly difficult and challenging conditions uh, to um, inform people, to hold uh, governments and leaders of one kind or another accountable. Nothing is more fundamental to the good functioning of our democracies. Um, and I think we're both resolute um, in our support uh, for, uh, for a free press. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's fitting that we uh, actually are addressing our colleagues from the press uh, on this day. And I have to tell you, it's particularly uh, good to be in London uh, for the first time as Secretary of State. I, I realized in, in, in thinking about it that the first time uh, I came to uh, the United Kingdom and to London was almost exactly 50 years ago and many, many times since. But it's especially good to be here today and especially good, Dominic, to have um, the chance to spend some real, uh, real time with you. Uh, we've, we've already met twice, I think, in person at, uh, at NATO. We've been on the phone uh, innumerable times. Uh, but there's nothing quite like being face-to-face or sometimes mask-to-mask. Uh, and um, I'm particularly pleased that we've had an opportunity to do that uh, here today and this will extend on for the next uh, the next few days. And to your point, President Biden is very much looking forward uh, to being uh, here for the uh, G7 in just a little over a month. That was an excerpt from the press conference at 10 Downing Street yesterday between the UK Foreign Secretary Dominic Robb and the US Secretary of State Tony Blinken. And that's just an excerpt. You heard the two of them speaking about um, their meeting. They're going to be talking to Prime Minister Boris Johnson of the UK uh, today. Certainly, uh, Tony Blinken will. Tony Blinken, of course, is the Secretary of State, as I said, uh, here in the US for Joe B- in Joe Biden's administration. Someone who, oh gosh, I'm not a big fan of Tony Blinken. Nah, uh-uh. Uh, no, no. Uh, just look at his record. You know, yeah, not not a big fan. Um, not a big fan. Kind of a hawkish guy, actually. But again, um, rather have him there than who we had there. Oh God. I mean, again, both of them aren't really great either. I mean, Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, really. Pfft. 
That guy's going to run for president. I, I'm convinced of it. There's going to be a load of Republican challenges in 2024. But that's not for this day to opine on and, and weigh in on. Um, I wanted to play that because it's just very interesting um, that there appears to be a lot of movement now and a movement around Iran and some possible breakthroughs in agreements between the United States and Iran on a number of things. And I think the UK also is in this too. And I think that this meeting, and I know it was scheduled to happen, but this meeting to me also, I bet you anything, and of course it's, it's a sucker's, it's an easy bet because they're going to talk about all these spots on the planet that they're going to talk about. And the US and UK, again, are the uh, the two biggest colonizers or the two, certainly the two biggest imperialist nations um, right now. I mean, come on. Uh, am, I, am, I, am I lying? They're the two biggest, right now they are and have been, especially the UK has. Um, ha, and, uh, you know, my goodness gracious me, who colonized most of the earth? Three-fifths of the earth. Colonized by who? The British. To the point in which my country is being called Great Britain. And I don't know what's so great about colonizing three-fifths of the earth. But if you can tell me, you can drop me a line at politocratpod at gmail.com. Um, let's go back to this. So Tony Blinken and Dominic Raab, one of the most incompetent foreign secretaries the UK has ever had. I mean, he shouldn't have that job. He is incompetent, much like the rest of the Tory government is. Incompetent. Absolutely impotent. They cannot, well, they cannot get it up. They can't do it. They can't do anything to effectuate, well, like you get the idea. So, look, they had their meeting yesterday, and I guarantee you they're going to be talking about Iran, and they did talk about Iran. I wasn't there. I wasn't even a fly on the wall, but I bet you they were talking about Iran, among other places, because Iran, right now, there's a lot going on, and I think that the news story that came out on Sunday about the Iranians saying that we're not going to release the British Iranian prisoner, Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, until the United Kingdom pays us the, is it 400 million that they owe us? That they, we're, not gonna, we're not going to release her. Her release is conditional upon that payment. And the, the British owe, let me be clear here, the British actually do owe Iran $400 million or pounds. They owe that money, 400 million pounds. They actually do owe Iran that. And then there were all these denials. Oh no, this is God. Now, Dominic Robb himself, the foreign secretary, of the UK. Oh no, this has got nothing to do with that. I assure you, that's not what we're doing here. Z Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe has to be released. She must be released. For those of you who do not know uh, who Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe is, a brief primer here for those of you who are unfamiliar. Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe um, was literally on holiday, I believe in Tehran. And she was arrested and was accused of spying and teaching bad things to people. And, and it was just ridiculous. And Boris Johnson testified and lied during his testimony before some committee and did not stick up for Nazneen Zaghari Ratcliffe, who is a UK citizen, you know, lied about her. And ended up compounding her problems. And she's behind bars basically because of Boris Johnson. I mean, isn't that wonderful? That your own prime minister can put you to the sword like that. And then he's trying to be so magnanimous now. And then he's got his secretary of state there. Um, the foreign secretary, uh, Dominic Robb. Oh, no. Uh, her release has got to happen right away. It can't be because of um, the 400 million pounds that we owe Iran. <sighs> but everybody knows how dirty this all gets. Governments do this stuff. 
I mean, does everybody already forget arms for hostages? The arms for hostages, United States, Ronald Reagan, for release of American hostages. Do you remember that? I don't know if you're old enough to. I don't know if you're young enough to. But if you are old enough to, you will have remembered that. And that you will remember that Ronald Reagan, before he became President Reagan, before he became President Ronald Reagan, said to the Iranians, no, we're not going to release the hostages. Don't release the hostages. I can get you a better deal. Sound familiar? Tricky Dick Nixon, 1968. Hold off. I don't want you to participate in those peace talks. Walk away from the table. Don't bother with it. I want you guys in the South Vietnamese, walk away. Walk away now from this Parisian peace talks. I, walk away because they were held in Paris. Walk away from them. I can get you a better situation. Just wait a couple of months or wait a few weeks. I will get you in. Because what, if I get elected, I assure you, you'll be better off. And they were worse off. He got elected. And uh, I, listen, I think it's treasonous. I mean, he got in by the skin of his neck over Hubert Humphrey. I mean, it was awfully close. It was literally a percentage point or so. It was very close. He got in. And 1968 was such a turbulent year. I told you how I have maintained forever that in the United States, 1968 was the most pivotal year, single year in the history of the country. And I know there are others, but I think this one, 1968, for many a reason, was the most pivotal year in the United States history. But well, again, that's a whole nother uh, episode, really. But the point is, is that this has happened before. And that's what I was illustrating by going back to Nixon. And Reagan did this in uh, pre the election, during the election season. Jimmy Carter was um, looked at as ineffective in some circles. And he was running for a second term. There was a lot of dissension in 1980 because I talked about Kennedy, Ted Kennedy. Oh, yes, Mr. Chappaquiddick himself. Um, you know, he's no longer here. Um, Mr. Chappaquiddick himself um, had such animosity. There was such animosity between Kennedy and Carter in 1980 that there was a broker convention and that really killed Carter. Carter came out of that convention that year, the Democratic convention in 1980, a weakened man, a weakened candidate, a weakened president. And by the time it got to the election a couple of months later, he was kaput and Reagan defeated him. And Reagan got in there in large part through treason and manipulation. And so the hostages, he delayed the release of the Iranian hostages. President Carter had, had them all set to go and all set to be released. And Ronald Reagan said, now, you know, let's delay this for a bit. I can give you better terms than what you've agreed to. Delay it. So please don't release them until after the election because I'm guaranteeing you I'm going to win this thing uh, and you're going to get even better. So they delayed the release of the hostages. And then when Reagan got in, boom, they got them released. So it happened under Reagan. So the perception is, oh, Reagan released the hostages. And now he did. So Americans were held hostage for a further God knows how many weeks so that this guy could get in office. That's the, si- that's the size of it, dear listener. And I'm telling you, dirty stuff like this happens. Your government ain't your country. You have to differentiate between your government and your country. Because governments do some god-awful things. Yes, governments can do some very good things and have done some very good things. Very valuably good things. But they also do some really rotten ass things too. And we've, I've just given you a couple of examples. And Boris Johnson, I'm telling you, he has really done more damage to Nazanin Zagari Ratcliffe than he has helped her. I mean, it's really bad. I mean, I think this UK Secretary of State, Foreign Secretary, Dominic Robb, has been so ineffective so ineffectual. He can't get the killer of the young boy, Harry Dunn, 
the lad Harry Dunn, who was killed by an American, by the way, who happens to be the uh, spouse of an American diplomat. Couldn't even get her extradited back to the UK. And I really would like President Biden to play a role and Tony Blinken to play a role in trying to get Anne Sekoulis, who ran over and killed Harry Dunn and complete and kept driving. Speaking of bad drivers, right? Right? Another white woman, by the way. You know, except this time, in this case, this particular dick ran over and killed an 18-year-old boy. The lad Harry Dunn. And I just remember his parents there, they were, you know, these are, you know, the, 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 this, this boy, you know, you know, 18, run over. And, you know, it's a white, white boy, 18 years old. It's a kid. And, th- and Ann Sekulis ran him over and kept, r- and kept driving, kept driving. Harry Dunn's on a motorcycle or a bicycle. I think it's a motorcycle. And she just ran. And she was driving. Speaking of, remember I said about how in the U.S. the passenger, the uh, driver's seat and the steering wheel are on the left side of the car? Well, she drove down the wrong side of the road in England, in an English road, ran him over, and then just kept driving. And Donna Grob can't get her back here? And I get it. There's a prick in the White House um, the last four years, but I'm telling you between now and Joe, Joe Biden, President Biden has got to get her extradited back to the UK. It's just got to happen. And you, you, wait, she just gets to run this poor lad over, run the boy over and then just keep going. I'm, I'm, I'm effing off to the U S now. Really? Is that how it works? But that is how it's worked. And Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe is still in prison. Now, she had an ankle bracelet on. She was under house arrest in Tehran somewhere. Or in, you know, somewhere in Iran. And now, last week, week before, they imposed, the Iranians, imposed a one-year prison sentence on her. This is clearly a political bargaining chip and it, that they, they, the Iranians, are using. And the UK are acting as if, oh, no, we're not going to accept this. This is all posturing. And you're using they, both both of them, the Iranians and the UK under this wretched government there, the Tory government, Boris Johnson's government, are using Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe as a political football. And it's disgusting. It's not the first time it's happened, of course, in this, in you know, in the world. But... This one is as vehement as all the rest of them. And it's as disgusting as all the rest of them. All the other political footballs. Because Boris Johnson testified and he helped put her behind bars in the first place. Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe should be reunited with her child and her spouse. Who has campaigned for her for a number of years now. And I believe that the UK are going to pay this money if they haven't already. And I'm telling you, this meeting between Blinken and Rob yesterday at 10 Downing Street, it was so interesting because when they met, (laughs) Blinken was standing next to Rob and they were standing at the, um, the Union flag, right? The Union flag, which is the flag of the United Kingdom. And they were standing there and Blinken <laughs> kind of got frozen and he thought that he was supposed to stand by the UK flag and then Dominic Robb is signaling him, no, the American flag is over there. <laughs> and so he's like, oh, and he, he makes a motion, does Blinken, to kind of move and he's like not sure because he thinks that Robb is going to move over to the American flag <laughs> and then Blinken perhaps is going to stand by the UK flag and it's like, no, the Union flag and Rob's like, no, no, no. And he points over to the Amer- You're over there. <laughs> I don't know if that's kind of symbolic of something or not. But I like to try to f- kind of find some symbolism in all of that. And I just kind of found it funny. But anyway, I, I played that audio there earlier to illustrate what I think may be going on in some of this. 
And don't be surprised if in the next few weeks that you hear of the release of Nazanin Zagari Ratcliffe. I'm predicting to you that in the, within the next month or so, whether it's this month or in June sometime, you're going to have this news story where Nazanin Zagari Ratcliffe is released. I can tell there's all kinds of posturing going on. There's stuff in the news about this. Again, I, I've seen it uh, during this day. I've seen it. You know, there's some stuff going on. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you. Something is going on here with this. And we'll see. We'll see. I, I just hope she gets released. I, I mean, this is just ridiculous. Please release. And by the way, all political. And she's not even a political prisoner. I mean, she is in a sense. But she didn't even do anything. There are people in the United States. There are people in countries all over the world who are actual political prisoners who have been put in prison simply because they're standing up for human rights. Or the state views them as subversive. We've had our fair share of political prisoners here in the US. We still do. I mean, Angela Davis was once a political prisoner. Now she's teaching at the University of Santa Cruz. Now, you know Angela Davis. And um, that's one of the things I'm going to do, by the way. I'm going to give away her autobiography. As a thank you for those of you who listen to this daily podcast, I will be giving away one of them at random. And I'll, I'll announce that soon on social media. And I am back on uh, Twitter uh, as of today at the popcorn R-E-E-L. And another other social media as well. But there you have it. Um, you'll find a tweet on there. The one tweet so far, the first tweet, I should say, back um, after four or five days away um, was about uh, Asian Americans and Asians in general facing persecution in the United States and George Takai um, really doing a good job. In fact, I'll play it for you um, in the break um, of this really good ad. I thought the ad was really good. The audio of it you'll get to hear, but you'll see the video of it on my uh, Twitter a feed as the first tweet back. And I think it's really important what George Takai had to say. Uh, and it's from an organization called FacingHistory.org. Really good. I mean, this is really, really good stuff. You've got to listen to this. So I'll play that in a moment. But this whole thing with Iran, it, I mean, it's it's just very clear to me, dear listener, that these meetings aren't just by accident. And I'm telling you, you're going to start to see some movement here. Uh, I, I'm pretty confident of that. And um, yeah, I think it's going to happen in the next few weeks. I will be very happy. And I'll be very happy not only for Nazanin Zagari Ratcliffe and her family, but I would be really happy as well if all of these other dissidents and as they're called and political prisoners are released. I mean... You know, look at what's going on in Russia with Alexei Navalny, Alex Navalny, who is, as you know, or some of you know, um, one of the top opponents uh, to Vladimir Putin, the dictator, because he's never called that, is he? Or he's rarely called that. Because you know, the British, the UK press and the American press don't call him a dictator, but he is. Vladimir Putin is a dictator. And people like Alexei Navalny have been saying this forever. And, you know... They're poisoned for saying things like this. Poisoned. I mean, he was nearly killed by Putin or his acolytes. And the guy was dying, basically. And he was literally a few minutes away from dying. And he was flown to Germany. He was uh, given intensive care, um, revived and everything else. And selflessly, he decided, you know what? I'm going to go back and face the prison sentence that I'm almost certainly going to get. And he said if he could have stayed exiled like Edward Snowden, right? And Edward Snowden is still, I think, in Moscow somewhere or he, wherever he is in the world. Where in the world is Carmen San Diego? <laughs> and, and, and there's nothing. Again. And listen, I know. And I remember people were, by the way, were all over Edward Snowden. Oh, how dare he? He's a traitor. And what's Donald Trump? What was he? What is he? And you're going on about Edward Snowden. Oh, please. Oh, please, the guy was doing you a public service, telling you about what this government does to you, spying and all this other stuff. 
He, you know, oh, but ooh, he's a bad guy. Ooh, my God. Ooh, he put national security in danger. What did Donald Trump do? <laughs> yeah, oh, well, only uh, an insurrection and terrorist attack. Yeah, January 6th. Oh, that, that's all. Oh, you know, letting Russians come in uh, and spy. He's giving them, or giving them, rather, let me be accurate. <laughs> giving them confidential secrets, classified secrets, letting in, uh, you know, the Russian Secretary of State, only allowing Russian media into the White House, banning all American press for this event at the White House where he gave classified secrets to the Russians. You think I'm joking? Go look at the Washington Post from April 2017 or May 2017. Look at that. He gave classified intelligence, U.S. intelligence, briefings and secrets to the Russians in the White House and banned American press from covering the event and only Russian press was allowed in. Yes, that's right. And some of you or some of the people in the world were more concerned about Edward Snowden. But I digress, right? But, you know, I think that all these people should be released, like Nazneen Zagari Ratcliffe should be, should be released. All these people. But Alexei Naz- uh, Navalny, you know, look at he, what he did, right? Stood up to Putin, that's his crime. Standing up to Vladimir Putin, and that gets him nearly killed. And it has gotten other people killed. Political opponents, journalists, they're all done. Kill. It's what this dictator does. He's a murderer, Putin. He's a murderer. And he sits there smugly and says, oh no. But this is what happens. And Alexei Navalny now is on a hunger strike. I think he still is. And he's in there behind bars. He had a court hearing last week. The guy looks like he's about to die to begin with. Uh, and this is really, I'm telling you, there are people who make sacrifices. And he's one of them. He really is. And there's, he's not the only one. I don't want to lionize and send to him. I'm just saying, right? There are lots of people who make sacrifices. People who fast like he has been doing. Uh, other people around the world that you've never heard of. And you don't know if the media didn't spot, spotlight them. You've got environmental activists who do extraordinary things on the African continent. Like Vanessa Nakate. She doesn't get the spotlight here in the U.S., or in the UK, that she should be getting. Greta Thunberg is getting all of that. Not her fault. Not her fault. But the media looks at Greta Thunberg and says, oh, she is 16 or 17 and she's white and she's female and we're going to center everything about the environment around her. As if she's the only person who cares. Now again, this is not about Greta Thunberg specifically because she's not the one saying, I want you to cover only me. And project me as the face of climate change and and fighting it and climate activism. No, 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 no. It's not her fault. It's the corporate news media and these white executives, white male executives in particular, who take this view that we've got to center this particular white person. Never mind all of the places in the world where climate is really ravaging these countries that have already been ravaged by colonialism, the British by invasions, the Americans, right? And so never mind the fact that all of these black and brown countries have been ravaged by the climate and by everything about that, right? Never mind that. And there are activists all over those places. You never get to see them on your TVs. You never get to. You might see them on Twitter, but you don't generally get to see them on your television set. And that's because the media that is brought to you or that brings things to you is making decisions to only spotlight people they want to spotlight. Because we don't want to give Vanessa Nakate or any of these other black and brown climate activists, such as the ones in the Philippines, for example. We don't want to spotlight them because, you know, they don't care about the climate. That's a white thing. (laughs) Yeah, okay, whatever. But this is what is projected. This is the ethos of the milieu that these media executives, these white male media executives swim in and what we're swimming in. If you don't see you, 
then maybe you don't think you. Jamiroquai there with Vitamin. I, I, gosh, I love that tune. Jamiroquai is just terrific. I mean, phew. anyway, I mean, I can go on and on um, forever about Jamiroquai. Great music. Vitamin there from the album Automaton. Or as I sometimes pronounce it, Automaton. <laughs> uh, potato, potato, tomato, tomato, you know. So yeah, headlines and deadlines, welcome back. Thank you very much uh, for being here and listening. Really appreciate you. I really do. And thank you very much. And I hope your day um, is improving. Um, Your evening, your afternoon, your morning, whenever you're listening, thank you. And I hope it is getting better for you in in day-to-day. Day-to-day, really important because every day can be a challenge and it's important to do the best you can. Um, with all the circumstances and it's very difficult for many people and I recognize that you know all of us we all go through challenges sometimes those challenges are big and sometimes they're not quite as big and then there are people in the world who go through some real horror and I, I just empathize with all of those individuals and if those individuals also include you then that means I empathize with you On your best and worst days and on the times when you're really going through some really difficult things in your life, in life in general. And I just um, wish you, um, to all of you listening, wish you everything in the way of best health and onward and upwards. I really do. And for a life for you that's fulfilling, um, that is a better life for you, that puts you in a better place, that sees you in a better space. So thank you for listening. I want to just um, get here to the last push on of today's episode. The headlines and deadlines. And, you know, the headlines, another one here. Manchester City battles Premier League over alleged rule breach. Now, you know, look, I've talked about Manchester lately. Of course, in yesterday's episode, I made a big show to talk about this. It wasn't a big show. It was a big story that Manchester United fans, some of them, had decided to break into Old Trafford in the name of protesting against some thuggish American owners called the Glazers. And uh, yeah, you know, yeah, that's a, that's the way to do it, isn't it? To bust into your own stadium. And, you know, I talked about that ad infinitum yesterday. I don't want to go over it again. But now there's the other Manchester, the blue half of Manchester, Manchester City, who are going to win the Premier League, I think, this weekend happened to play a Champions League game coming up um, today. If they, By the time you listen to this, they may already have played it. But they are in the driver's seat to go to the Champions League final, which would be their first under Pep Guardiola. Maybe their first ever. But Pep Guardiola is a very successful coach in football. And Manchester City have a multi-billionaire owner named Sheikh Mansour. And this New York Times article today talks about Manchester City battling the Premier League over the alleged rule breach of some money that the Premier League is contending that Manchester City haven't really earned through sponsorships. They've earned it through some hanky-panky. And I told you about the billionaires earlier. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Billionaire lay down his sweet head. Now, I told you that that applies to Sheikh Mansour, who is a multi-billionaire. And he took over ownership of Manchester City, what, roughly 10 years ago or so, and everything turned around for them. Their fortunes have now skyrocketed. They've won, uh, they're going to now win their fourth Premier League trophy in the last 10 years. They are, you know, still not as big as Manchester United as a club. (laughs) Don't tell the blue half of Manchester that, though. But it's true. They're still not a big club. I mean, they are one of the big six, but they're not as big a club as Manchester United. And I know Manchester City fans will absolutely score me. Look, Manchester City destroyed my team in an FA Cup final just two years ago. 
my team Watford got absolutely smashed at Wembley Stadium. And I had a front row seat. Literally. Well, I wasn't in the front row. But I was at Wembley. I was at Wembley Stadium. I got to watch that in person. It was not a pleasant experience. 6-0. And then to have the City fans chanting at you. (laughs) I actually uh, took some pictures with these folks. Actually, they wanted to take pictures with me. (laughs) And lampoon my team. But, you know, actually, there were some very decent Manchester City fans that day. Outside of Wembley Stadium. And they were cheering. I still got, they got the video of all of this. Cheering and good for them. They won three trophies that year. They did the treble. They won the Premier League that year. They won the FA Cup that year. And they also won the League Cup that year. This year, so far, they've won the League Cup. They're going to win the Premier League this Saturday. And they are going to get to the Champions League final. If they haven't already by the time you listen to this. They played Paris Saint-Germain, last year's finalists. By the way, Paris Saint-Germain defeated Manchester City, if I'm not mistaken, in last year's semifinals. If I'm not mistaken, or quarterfinals, whichever it was. So I think Manchester City here gets some revenge. But the story is not that. The story is how Manchester United fans were complaining, were complaining, were rioting. Can we just get that right? There were some protesters and then there were some rioters. And the rioters broke into the stadium. Broke in through barriers at the police. I don't think I even put that in the audio bits that I gave you yesterday in the episode. Through barriers at police. One cop had his eye that he dricked out. I mean, you know, uh, come on. Oh, but that was that was just a disturbance. That was just them letting off steam. <laughs> come on. I told you, uh, these, these white guys, they, you know, they get to commit violence without repercussion. And it goes to government too, by the way. You know, you know George W. Bush killing a million Iraqis. He doesn't get to get impeached for that. They don't get any, he doesn't get thrown in the Hague for committing war crimes, lying to us all and then killing a million Iraqis. Yeah, no, he doesn't get to go to, any, you know, seven, eight thousand, six thousand, however many thousand American service persons killed because of his lies. Oh, I know. Who, he doesn't go to the Hague. He's not locked up. He's celebrated. He's written a new book. He's going on a book tour. He's going on a book tour. Virtual or otherwise. He should be going to The Hague. And they got people in this country lionizing the man. The war criminal. Yeah, you know, like I say, they don't get, you know, Nixon, did he go to prison? No. LBJ, did he? Kennedy? No, 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 no. All of them had their fingerprints on Vietnam. Come on. Come on. Oh, no, no, no. They get pardons, you see. See, Nixon, he gets pardoned. He gets pardoned forever. So they get away with their murder. So, you know, you know the white guys, they don't, they don't go to prison for murder. I mean, Derek Chauvin might. We don't know what he... Listen, folks, next month, I want to remind you, you need to be writing to that courthouse... You need to be writing to your senators and the senators in Minnesota. You need to be writing to the local politicians in Minnesota. The mayor, Jacob what, Fry, um, not related to Glenn Fry, who is no longer with us, of the Eagles, who some people really hate. I don't know why people hate the Eagles. But anyway, you need to be writing to people in Minnesota who have power. You need to be writing to Senator Klobuchar. You need to be writing to Senator Tina Smith. You need to be writing to all the, the Minnesota governor. You need to write to, You need to be dropping them tweets and emails and phone calls. You need to be going to the Hennepin County Courthouse. You need to be calling them, leaving voicemails. You need to do it because I'm telling you, you turn off and next month, June 16th, when, he, when his ass, that murderer's ass gets sentenced, let's see what he gets sentenced to. But if you don't do anything, there's a chance he may get 10 and a half years 12 and a half years and not the at least 60 that he should be getting for murdering Mr. Floyd and doing it in the way he did, executing him. Keep up the heat. I want to say that. But yeah, you know, you know, these, these, by and large, these white guys, they don't go to prison for, for anything. I mean, come on. They, all this violence, whether it's these, are they going to prosecute these? Thugs at Manchester United? 
I mean, they say they are, but we'll see. You know, have they prosecuted anybody yet? These thugs here who are terrorists who went in into the Capitol in uh, in January, January 6th of this year, and then they killed six people, I had a hand in that, seven people, whatever it was. Because, I mean, there were other deaths afterwards. People took their lives as a result of the actions of these murderers and terrorists, thugs, white males. Hey, yo, yo. Are they going to prison? And I'm hearing these stories in, uh, circulating online or on, in these newspapers. Well, uh, it may be difficult to prosecute them. They may not spend time in jail. Like, well, oh, yeah, really? Let that be some black folk raising a fuss and a ruckus. We wouldn't even have to get into the jail cell because we'd be killed. We'd be dead. And besides, it wouldn't even get that far. They would have shot us on sight. We don't have to have any insurrection or terrorist act. We can just be walking down the street and someone can come up and murder us. For just walking the street like the human beings we are. And some cop can roll up on us like Tamir Rice and blow him to kingdom come. Oh, a toy gun. Ooh, he had a toy gun. So we've got to kill him for that. Twelve-year-old boy. But these guys don't go to prison for that. And that guy gets rewarded by killing Tamir Rice, the brother. Gets rewarded for killing the brother. That white boy goes on to another job at another police precinct two towns over. Ain't that charming? Huh? Charming. Oh, I wish I could get away with killing people and then get rewarded by keeping my pension, keeping my friggin' salary and getting a new job somewhere else. Ain't that grand. So, yeah, no accountability, no accountability. And it goes from, you know, whether you're some white boy like George Zimmerman, whether you're some white boy like, you know, Derek Chauvin. I mean, well, Derek Chauvin is the exception that proves the rule. But, you know, Matt, uh, you know, Daniel Pantaleo, or these four cops in Simi Valley, who were L.A. cops, who the Simi Valley jury were really Simi, and they let them go. Because now nah, Rodney King... No, he wasn't a human being, you know. He's a bear. He's a big bear, right? And that's what these white people think, right? So that, that these white people on that jury, that's what they thought. Now, not every white person thinks this way. But I'm telling you, the society certainly makes... Uh, listen, the society thinks that way. The system thinks that way. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had over 100 years of demonizing black people in Hollywood in movies, on TV, in magazines, right? We wouldn't have had all that. We wouldn't have had Jim Crow. We wouldn't have, if, if, if white society and the white system thought that we as black people were human beings and saw our humanity, we wouldn't have had all this stuff. We wouldn't have had Jim Crow. We wouldn't have had to fight and die for a Voting Rights Act, which the Supreme Court of this country has stripped away, basically. And now, ooh, I'm not going to overthrow a filibuster, Joe Manchin, Democrat of West Virginia. Ooh, I'm not going to do that, even if it's for the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Shut up. I mean, the enemies of progress. There you go. Enemies of progress. Yeah, I mean, Joe Manchin, what a piece of work. So, yeah, you know. These white guys, they can go and kill. They can go to other countries and invade the countries and destroy people's countries and destroy their cultures. When did they get put in prison for any of that? Murder the Native Americans, enslave black people, rape black women and, you know, plunder and and all this. Burn down towns in uh, Greenwood, Tulsa, Oklahoma. You know, where's the penalty for that? It's been happening for centuries. Where's the prison time for them? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I know. You can't hear the bars shutting, can you? You can't hear those prison cell uh, bars and doors sh- slamming shut on them. You know? But when you commit crimes against the rich, like Bernie Madoff, you get to die in prison, as he did last month. <sighs> so anyway, match the city. There's an article in the New York Times today, Manchester City, Tariq Panja, May 4th, 2021. May the 4th be with you. Uh, this is a good article because you've got one Manchester side, the Red Half, fighting about the Glazers in the Super League, which, of course, the Super League ended for now after fans kicked up a stink in a non-violent way. 
But because now Manchester United fans, some of them became absolute thugs on Sunday. Now the Premier League's got a charter. Ooh, this is what the Premier League requires every owner to sign this charter. And if there's any breach of it, there's going to be severe sanctions. What sanctions are there? I mean, come on. Give me a break. Why didn't the Premier League do this immediately after the Super League was disbanded? Why didn't they? Why did they wait until some thugs, thugs at a, a football club, some English football hooligans, why did they wait until they ripped up a friggin' stadium? They couldn't even play the game between Manchester United and Liverpool on Sunday. Why? Because the stadium was unsafe. It was damaged. They damaged it to the point where they couldn't eat in a pandemic. You don't even have people in the blooming place, but training staff from both clubs and the players and some of the a few commentators who were allowed in and some reporters. It's not a fit. It's not 77. Th- that's, that thing seats almost 80,000 people. I, I told you, I've been to Old Trafford. I've been there on, on, to watch a game. I've been there. I've toured it. I've seen it. I've been around the city of Man. I've been around Manchester. And you got these thugs. I mean, not every, I'm not going to say every, because everybody in Manchester ain't a thug, right? But these particular people you saw on goalposts and, and throwing camera equipment around and then asking a steward to toss, toss me my sneaker, please. I just threw over, you know, uh, eighty eight eight thousand dollars $8,000 worth of camera equipment. But can you throw me my sneaker, please? I lost it in, in my frenzied riot. And the steward sits there and throws the blooming sneaker to him, too. And he's running on a parapet. You know, these white boys, they just run around. They run on the play. It's a playpen. You know, in the Senate, they swing from the frick like monkeys, right? They swing. Literally, the guy's hanging from the wall of the Senate. January 6, 2021. I'm not making this up. Guy's swinging like he's Spider-Man or something. Hanging there with, with friggin' twist ties ready to tie up Speaker Pelosi with. And these same white boys who are, you know, trying to kidnap and kill Governor Whitman. You know, these people being, I mean, I know they're being indicted and prosecuted, but what about all these people on January 6th? Again, they get away with it. I know, I've digressed again. But this is a fact. This ain't anything to do with, oh, oh, Omar, you're being racist. Oh, you're, no, no, it's right in front of you. This system has protected white males forever. And it doesn't matter if they're rich. It doesn't matter whether they're in government. It doesn't matter whether they're thugs. Like these Manchester United players, um, excuse me, players, these Manchester United fans, so-called, they are fans, who ran in blocked hotel entrances and set a flare. I mean, that ain't protesting Jack. That is violence and that is a riot. And when you are throwing camera equipment and you're throwing barriers at police and tossing bottles at them, pelting them with bottles and attacking cops with bottles and damaging a stadium and injuring people. That's a fucking riot. Oh my God, so much going on, so much going on. I promise this is really going to be the final segment. (laughs) It's going to be the final segment. This is the final segment, and uh, aren't you happy? (laughs) There's one headline in The Guardian today. Why do Americans die earlier than Europeans? This is, I think this is an op-ed. Yes, it is. Why do really Samuel Preston and Jana Veerboom have to ask that question? And that may well have been a uh, headline question. But come on, come on. I've told you why. The healthcare system. (laughs) God. I mean, by the way, India, speaking of which, um, India, let me say this. India now has the second highest rate of coronavirus deaths. This is just so bad. It is so bad. And so sad. Behind the US now. It's it's just really sad. India is second. Oh boy, this is very very sad to hear. It's very very sad. Twenty million cases. Actually, the death rate. I don't know. Actually, let me change that. The death rate. I'm not sure, 
but the second highest amount of cases of COVID. Let me correct myself. 20 million. They've had to suspend the cricket league there, the Premier League of Cricket in India. That's been suspended, canceled, suspended. The UK did send now another thousand more um, ventilators. They did. They, that was reported on Sunday. Um, but look, we need more. They need more. They need more. It's a start, but more. I'm sorry. And they have sent 200 ventilators prior to that. Boris Johnson's government has added another thousand to it. There are, you have to understand, the population of India... 1.4 billion people. The number of people vaccinated, 26 million. That's 2%. The number of cases daily, roughly now, over 400,000 cases of COVID a day. And 1,000 more ventilators with thousands and thousands of people queuing up for oxygen for their friends and family. And relatives, good luck. Oh, goodness me. This is really bad, folks. It's really bad. And all over the world, you know, the COVAX program needs more funding. Because, listen, there's still so many countries that aren't getting this vaccine. You know, uh, the WHO uh, leader... um, Mr. Tudros, Tid Tudros, the Tudros, the 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 you know the guy that runs the WHO, the head of the WHO has said that Covax need to get its act and its ass together, and he said this last month. And less than one percent of these countries, he said, have been fully vaccinated. In these countries that have been ravaged by colonialism, the British, and by invasions, the Americans. This is very, very perilous now. We've got to do something. We've got to do something. Other news, other news, other news. Headlines. Deadline first, by the way. Taxes in the United States. May 17th is the last day to file your taxes for 2020. So please do so. File your income taxes if you haven't done so. And do it today. Deadline, last date to file for 2020, May the 17th. That is 13 days from today. So please, please, if you haven't filed your taxes yet, do so now. Back to the headlines. Headlines, Charlie Crist, who used to be a Republican and who used to be an independent and may have been the governor of Florida at one point is now going to be running for the governorship of Florida as a Democrat, because he's a Democrat now. He's been for a few years and he's going to be running against Ron Death Sentence. Although in other words, Ron DeSantis is his nickname, but his real name is Ron Death Sentence. So he'll be running Charlie Crist will against Ron Death Sentence for governor. Nickname is Ron DeSantis. So that's a development. The uh, Republican uh, leader in the House of Representatives in the U.S., that would be from California, the guy named Kevin McCarthy, the guy who once admitted that they got the Republicans in the House, did got Hillary Clinton to testify in 2015 during her presidential campaign in order to try to hurt her campaign. And that statement, that open admission on television by Kevin McCarthy cost him the speakership opportunity that he was almost certainly going to be given. So anyway, he says that the Republicans are losing confidence in Liz Cheney of Wyoming. She is the same Liz Cheney who came out against her own sister, basically as an anti, anti-gay, and came out against Mary Cheney, who is gay, right? Her own sister. And said, oh, I don't approve of the, you know. And apparently there may be moves to, to oust her. I don't know how they're going to oust her, Liz Cheney. But that's apparently something that's in the offing, perhaps. President Biden yesterday um, 
uh, made procl- issued a proclamation for Older Americans Month, said that this month, May, is the month for Older Americans. Older Americans Month. I kid you not. It's nice to recognize us older folk. <laughs> we get a whole month to celebrate being older and being an American. I'd rather celebrate being older, although I am very happy to be here in this country. Uh, listen, America, look, for all the things I have said about this country's government and its attitude and the mentality of the culture and what it's done to us, there are still more opportunities in the United States of America than there are anywhere else. I kid you not. That is a fact. Okay? So, listen. Um, that it, that's the one thing you can put your hat, hat, your hang your hat on. Or I shouldn't use the word hang. But there's one place you can put your hat is in this. Take it to the bank. That the United States has more opportunities to excel and do well. Oh, that rhymes. Than anywhere else on the planet. Which is why people come here. So... That I have never forgotten. Never forgotten that. And I still don't forget it. But there's a lot we've got to fix in this country. And that's the point I'm making. 32% of people are fully vaccinated, according to the New York Times. 32% of the country, the US, fully vaccinated. 32%. We've got a long way to go. Long way to go. Local story in San Francisco, there was a story. Um, there's still so many people here who won't get the vaccinations. Ah, uh, you know, that that's just perfect, isn't it? So you don't want to get vaccinated. Shame on you. Honestly, to those it applies to, shame on you. You really should be absolutely ashamed of yourselves. And if you've got kids, you really should be ashamed of yourselves. You're not setting a very good example. Mexico's president vows an inquiry after a deadly train crash in Mexico City. This was really horrible. This happened yesterday. 70 people were injured, 23 people killed. I mean, this train was on a a track, uh, on an overpass, and it just plunged to the ground right there. Oh, it's just really horrible. That's horrible. That's the, well, I don't want to... I'm not going to, I don't need to find an American equivalent to make everybody clear on how horrible that crash in Mexico City was and is. So I will spare that kind of laziness and, you know, invisibility invisibility of Mexico City because that's not what I'm going for here. Oh, we find out now that there was a plan to present, to prevent a stampede in Israel um, where 45 people were killed at a, a festival, religious festival last week. 45. 45 people. And it's funny, you look at the New York Times front page, it's not funny at all. And you see the name, the number 45. And of course, those people here in the United States who, who think of such things, think of the number 45 for some very other different reason. And you know what I'm talking about. The 46th president of the United States, Mr. Joe Biden, is actually uh, issuing, I think now, uh, Pfizer, um, in constance with the FDA, uh, approving it. Uh, 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 yeah, pro, pro, oh gosh, is actually uh, putting going forth with uh, declaring it to say for 15 year olds to take. And so there's going to be um, something like that coming up. Um, uh, there will be an announcement uh, or has been today by President Biden. F- Pfizer, by the way, is doing very well in profits from COVID-19. Of course, they're going to make profits. The generate at least $3.5 billion in revenue in the first quarter of the year. Pfizer, I tell you, and Moderna, I'm sure we'll see other profits. We'll see similar profits um, as well. Not profit, P-R-O-P-H-E-T, but profit, P-R-O-F-I-T, as in James Baldwin, all they care about, what they care about, is their profits and their safety, or their safety and their profits. Yeah, I know, Bill Gates and Melinda Gates are divorcing. Uh, you know, I think that's just another day in America, or just another day in the world. The divorce rate here in the United States is roughly 50%, 50%. 
Bean Wen, a Georgia Democrat, is running for Secretary of State. Good luck. I hope I hope that uh, Ms. Wen does well. I really do. I wish her all the best. Um, there's so many other news stories and headlines to get to. And my goodness, um, one of them is French uh, far-right leader, racist, uh, French leader, Marine Le Pen, Le Pen, was acquitted over some ISIS tweets um, that um, went out. She posted, the, posted these graphic pictures. And it was apparently, uh, you know, these comparisons between uh, ISIS and the national rally, which is the party she leads. Um, and the thing is, she's got this small mind. I mean, she just, doesn't, they don't have any seats in the French government, best I can tell. And she ended up deleting the post. It was some very graphic. I mean, it was just horrible. We aren't them. We aren't ISIS, though, but you're pretty damn close. Oh, look, dear, 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 dear. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, it's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, you know, whatever, whatever. Oh dear! And there's so much. There's so much more going on. You know. You know. We've got in two days' time in the UK. There's going to be an election, dear listener, and I will be getting on that a bit more the next day or two. But there's going to be an election. Will the Conservatives hold on to power? I think the answer is going to be yes. I think the answer is going to be an overwhelming yes. But I hope I'm wrong. Merrick Garland testified today. The U.S. Attorney General testified today in front of the House uh, representatives and said, you know, in the remote hearings, said, look, we need more money to fight these racists and domestic terrorists, you know, who destroyed our capital. And, you know, we need more money for that. Are you going to give it to us? Are you, are you, are you? Hubba, hubba, hubba. We need this money to fight this stuff. To fight these evil, violent people who are destroying the country and killing people. There's so much going on. So much going on. These days there's so much going on. That's right, Elton. There's so much going on. God, Pfizer, $26 billion from the annual sales of the COVID-19 vaccine. Like, whoa. By the way, this, uh, the Pfizer shot for ages 12 to 15 apparently is going to be early next week, not today. But there will be some comments from Joe Biden today about uh, vaccinations, as far as I know. And um, we'll see about it all. We'll see about it all. But look, um, I think because I am petering out here, <laughs> running out of things to tell you about, that I think. It all worth knowing. Um, I'm going to call it a day here for now on this edition of the Politocrat Daily Podcast. Remember, please check your health. And one of the things about health is being able to make sure you get a good night's sleep. That's very key as well to your health. So please get checked. You know, I know an FBI agent opened fire on an armed man outside the CIA headquarters. I'll talk about that a bit more. Um... You know, there's so much going on. A footballer, Dalian Atkinson in England, was murdered by a cop, a police officer in England. Um, That's going on in a court case around that and all this now. Look, um, so much going on, folks. So much going on. And actually, Biden will actually talk about this today, about the imminent approval of the vaccine, Pfizer vaccine for teenagers and tweens, 12 years old to 15 years old, you know, and above. So that is going to actually happen today. The FDA is going to approve it, expected to next week. So there you go. But look, be safe and be well, dear listener. And when you're running, watch out for the dicks on the road. Thank you very much for listening to this edition of The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore.